Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining class and welcome to class. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can one of you please lead us in prayer? And the person who's going to lead us in prayer can also pray for Charles' father, who's admitted in hospital. Uh, he's uh, having ulcers and um, uh, low blood sugar and dementia. So uh, just pray for discernment for the doctors, even as they treat him. And above all, just pray for supernatural healing to flow through his body, uh, for God's peace upon him and Charles and his family and uh, relatives as well. So can some of you, one of you, please lead us in prayer, please? Can I pray, Pastor? Sure, Asha. Thank you so much. Um, dear God, thank you so much, God, for this day. Lord, it's great that you remember the good things. I pray that we'll go in your wisdom and knowledge and help us to understand what we pray and what we do in the word of God. And I pray, thank you for a lot of Charles, God, Stephen, God. Do you need to declare healing over his body, God? I pray that everything in Jesus' name is declared, healed, restored, and we can pray for a divine miracles and healings taking place in his body, God. I pray for God, as we said, as we lay our hands, Lord, they shall be recovered, God. By faith, Lord, we lay our hands on um, Charles, God, Stephen, God, that he is healed in Jesus' name, that you are the way we pray, a miracle of God. Lord, I pray that when you already died 2,000 years ago and your, your, your blood can heal any kind of disease that's still, um, any kind of new viruses or any kind of thing, Lord. And I trust you right now for healing and miracles. And I pray uh, peace over his family, Lord. I pray that nothing shall strike by them, night or day or anything, Jesus, but everything will be. Uh, we pray Psalms 91 over their family protection, healing, restoration, everything in Jesus' name is declared right now. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Asha. Okay. Please continue to all of you can pray for. Uh, uh, Charles' dad, he's uh, bled in hospital uh, with low blood sugar and um, ulcers and dementia. So just pray for healing. Okay, we'll, uh, we're looking at the, the book of Romans, um, Paul's epistle to the church at Rome. Uh, we've come to Romans chapter 9. And, uh, you know, today's um, chapter, verses 9, 10, 11, is going to be very interesting because it focuses on a different theme. We'll have a lot of questions. So uh, just request all of you to listen carefully, understand, and just maybe wait till the end of the class where I can give you time after I've explained everything. Uh, then you can, uh, if you still have any questions, you can, you can please feel free to ask. Okay, so let's begin with uh, Romans chapter 9. It's talking about God's choosing. Now, you know, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, having brought us to this point of just that we are justified with God and our identification, uh, who we are in Christ and how we overcome and live the victorious life uh, in the midst of suffering. He's spoken to us about all of these things. Now, it's very interesting that in chapters 9 to 11, he focuses on a totally different theme. Um, we know that at the church at Rome, there were uh, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, so his focus in chapters 9 to 11 is what is God doing with the Jews? Okay. Uh, these are the very uh, these are very unique chapters. Uh, Paul does not discuss about this at length, like he explains here or discusses here anywhere else in his episodes. Of course, in uh, in one or two episodes, he just talks about it in one or two verses. Uh, but here, you know, is uh, he 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 explains or you know he discusses this in details in chapters nine to eleven about what is God doing with the Jews. But in the other episodes, one or two episodes, which he just makes a passing statement in just one or two uh, verses. But here, he's just concentrating three chapters uh, at a major portion of his um, letter to the church at Rome about what God is doing with the Jews. So what God is doing with the Jews, with the Jewish people. And it's very interesting how Paul presents uh, this truth to us. Uh, you know, um, uh, the question, uh, you know, that is in the heart and mind of Jews or the Gentiles, 
uh, has God abandoned the Jews because uh, of the church who are now his people, uh, you know, who he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So the church basically now is, uh, is God's people, his chosen people, uh, who he has predestined to be in the image of his son. Uh, because now since he's chosen the church, has he abandoned uh, the people that he chose as his nation to be uh, the model nation among all the nations of the world, the people that he chose among all the, the other peoples of the world. So has he abandoned them for the church? Uh, and then the other question that, you know, um, uh, Paul is trying to answer this also or look at is, uh, what should be the church's attitude towards the Jewish uh, people now some of the people you know they left uh, judaism and they embraced uh, jesus christ uh, they're still wondering you know uh, i'm following jesus who is a jew and uh, and a descendant of abraham like i or we all are descendants of abraham uh, we also believe in jesus as the messiah uh, and we are part of the church, uh, we are called, we are justified. Uh, but what about the other Jews who have not believed? What is God doing with the rest of the Jews who have not believed, who have not accepted Jesus, who are not part of the church, who have not been justified? Um, and the whole idea of uh, predestination that we spoke about a little in chapter 8 uh, comes up again in, in these chapters. Uh, and in, in, in these chapters 9 to 11 uh, are pretty strong chapters in addressing predestination uh, because, uh, you know, uh, God uh, chooses the Jewish people ahead of time. Uh, he's called Abraham. He's given him a promise uh, and given him the promises of blessings. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, God did all of this even before the ch church came into uh, existence. Uh, but now since the earth ch church has come into existence and they are the chosen people of God, uh, they receive the blessings, uh, uh, the promises, uh, uh, the covenants that are made is theirs also now. So what about the Jews? Okay, what? How does the church relate to the Jews? What happens to the plan of God? And uh, how is God going to, uh, uh, you know, fulfill his plan? Because here is... You know, we see the Old Testament is the the, uh, the Israelites or the Jews or the chosen people. And when we come to the New Testament, we see the church uh, is uh, given the keys of authority, God's chosen people, who he has chosen uh, to be conformed to the image of his son. Then what happens to, uh, uh, you know, all the promises that he has spoken about the chosen nation, the chosen people group, the, uh, the Jews, where do they stand now? Where did they come in this picture? Uh, what is God trying to, uh, what is God's plan? What is he trying to fulfill? How And how is he going to uh, go about um, doing this? So in chapters 9 to 11, Paul is addressing about the Jews and what is God going to uh, do with them. So it's very interesting. Um, so we will just look at it. Uh, I know you'll have a lot of questions. So, you know, just listen to carefully. Uh, and then by the end of the class, you can raise up all your questions if you still have any uh, doubts. Okay. So verse one, Paul says, "I tell, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit." Uh, verse two, he says that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Verse three, he says, "For I, I, uh, for I could wish that I myself were accursed." from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Verse 4 and 5, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, sorry, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall and eternally blessed God. Amen. So in verse 1, Paul is saying, uh, I tell the truth in Christ. So that means he's saying, I want to you know, share something that is in my heart. Uh, you know, or he's just basically unburdening his heart. Uh, he's saying his heart is filled with sorrow and continual uh, grief. Uh, uh, 
why is his so heart filled with sorrow and continual grief? What is uh, he unburdening his uh, or sharing from his heart? What is there in his heart? His, uh, his heart, his burden is for his uh, people. He longs for his people, the Jews, the chosen people of God. You know, he longs for them to come to uh, Christ. And he says, for I, I could... Uh, if for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Now, you know, very strong words that he's using. He's literally saying, you know, I don't mind going to hell as long as my Jewish brothers, you know, can come to uh, Jesus. And that is the burden that he's carrying in his heart. So very strong words. He's saying, it's okay if I go to hell. Uh, it's okay if I'm a curse, go to hell, um, if as long as, you know, my Jewish brothers come to know uh, Jesus Christ, they come to the faith, they believe in Jesus Christ. So this is a burdening, burden he's carrying for the Jews. And uh, this verse, you know, saying that he says, you know, um, you know, he's carrying uh, this grief and continual sorrow shows how much uh, desire and longing he has for his people, you know, the Jews to... Uh, come to know Christ. And, uh, you know, is that, uh, you know, the same uh, sorrow and grief that we carry in our hearts for our own people group, for our own families, family members who are lost, or, in, you know, the nation that we come from, or the country that we come from, uh, the place that we come from, you know, uh, is our heart so burdened, grieved, you know, or sorrowful that you know, people are lost, and the time of uh, Jesus' second coming is so soon, is at hand, and, you know, they'll be lost for eternity. And I think it's important that, you know, uh, we are burdened about people who are lost, just like, you know, Paul was so filled with sorrow and uh, grief. And similar to uh, Moses, you know, as we read in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 and 32, he was, he said, you know, he was willing to have his name blotted out of, the, of God's book so that Israel could be forgiven. I mean, that's the heart that uh, Moses carried uh, for his people. Um, you know, remember at one point of time, he didn't even want to go, uh, you know, and uh, go to Egypt and do what God was calling him to do at the burning bush. He had so many excuses. But here when he got into that shoes of that of being a leader, you know, he, he does not want to quit. There are times when God says, you know, take Moses, you take the people and go. My presence is not going with you. And we know how Moses buys God back into the picture. And, you know, he talks to God and tells, reminds him of the promises that he made. And, and God comes back and he says, okay, I'll come along with you. You know, uh, so we see that Moses does not quit. He does not give up. He has such a heart for uh, this people group that he's leading. Even though this people group, uh, this group of people have been so annoying, grumbling, murmuring, complaining. Uh, but we see that, uh, you know, Moses stands in the gap and um, intercedes. So uh, here as well, you know, Paul says in verse 1, he says, my conscience bears witness with the Holy um, Spirit. So here um, uh, we see that, you know, his conscience and the, uh, the, con and the uh, Holy Spirit bear witness Okay, so his conscience bears witness and the Holy Spirit also bears uh, witness. So what is our conscience? Our conscience is basically the voice of our own spirit. Uh, it's our inner voice. Our conscious, conscience has been pre-programmed by God to know what is right and is wrong. And we also know that it's not only our conscience, but the Holy Spirit also bears witness uh, in our spirit man. Okay, so there are two that is bearing witness. One is our conscience and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also bears, you know, inner witness uh, uh, in our spirit man, um, you know, uh, by giving us a red signal or the green signal. The red signal is when, you know, there's anxiety, there's worry, um, there's a restlessness, uh, there's a tightening in our spirit, a binding in our spirit, man. Uh, then we know the Holy Spirit is telling us through these emotions that it's not the right time to venture out, not the right time to do, not the right person to interact with. This is not something that you should be going ahead with. Uh, but if you sense peace, it's a way that the Holy Spirit tells us, okay, 
go ahead you know you can do it uh, you know he gives us a peace so that is the inner witness of the uh, holy uh, spirit and it's wonderful you know when our conscience uh, uh, you know bears witness and the holy spirit also bears witness when both of these are in agreement you know um, when my spirit is in complete agreement with the Holy Spirit testifying jointly about something, you know, um, it's wonderful. And it it makes the conviction much more stronger. You know, it brings about stronger conviction, complete assurance. Uh, there's a good uh, togetherness about the matter. Uh, and, you know, uh, and we feel that, you know, the confidence to go ahead and do what uh, uh, God wants us to do because we have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and also our conscience is bearing uh, witness. And our conscience can come to that place uh, where it's in, con in it's in tune with the uh, with the Holy Spirit, with our spirit man, is when our conscience are pure, set as, when our lives are pure, our motives are pure, when our lives are set aside for God, is when our conscience is also pure, and that's when it can also bear witness along with the Holy Spirit. Both are in total agreement. It's going to be just so powerful. It just brings about strong conviction, complete assurance, and uh, togetherness. And so here we see in this case, you know, Paul's conscience and the, uh, it bears witness, and the inner you know, witness of the Holy Spirit also is bearing witness uh, uh, in this case, it's about his heart for the Jewish uh, people. So we can just feel his burden uh, that uh, even as he talks about his grief and sorrow for his own people. Yes, we know that Paul was appointed to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, and he's doing that. He's been faithful to his call. Uh, and we know that he has been faithful. Uh, but, you know, still he has a heart and a burden for his own people, the uh, Jews. So Paul is basically setting up things for what he's uh, going to say. Uh, Paul is actually basically meaning here to say that, you know, yes, I'm an apostle, you know, uh, uh, by choice, willingly, I chose to become a born servant. Yes, I'm a preacher of, to, to the Gentiles. I'm called by God to preach to the Gentiles, but I'm also a Jew. Okay. So he's saying I'm an apostle to the church of Jesus Christ, and but I'm also a Jew. You know, I have a great heart for my own people. So he's basically positioning himself because he's going to be talking the next three chapters about the Jews and the church. And he wants to make his position or his stand very, very clear. He's trying to, uh, you know, tell, yes, I'm a apostle. I'm a, a, by choice, I've chosen myself to be a born servant of Christ Jesus. I also know that I have a calling to the Gentiles. But hey, I stand in this position here. I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm a born Jew. And I, hence, I have a burden for my own people. So he's trying to make his position clear so that what he's going to be mentioning or talking about or writing about in the next three chapters um, will, you know, people have a greater clarity about his stand and his uh, position. And in verse 4, he says, you know, who are the Israelites? The Israelites, the Jewish people, theirs is the adoption. That means God chose the Jews, the Israelites, uh, among all the nations of the world, among all the peoples of the world, to be his chosen people, to be his chosen uh, nation. And it was to them that he revealed his glory. They saw his glory, you know, uh, the glory of the ten plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the water from the rocks, the uh, manna, the quail, the way he fought the battles for them, the way he gave them the promised land. Uh, so, you know, they experienced his glory. They, they were the ones who were the recipients of receiving the law. Uh, they were the ones who received the covenants, though it's given to Abraham, the Mosaic covenant. Uh, theirs was the promises, you know, God was going to fulfill the promises through this nation of uh, Israel. And theirs was the priesthood as well, the service of God, which is talking about the priesthood. So, you know, all of these things, you know, God gave to uh, the people of Israel. But Paul later on, you know, not chapter 9, but later on he goes on to say that these blessings were now passed on to the uh, Gentiles. But yes, they were passed on to the Gentiles, but he's starting off from where God started. Where did God start? He started with the Jewish people, and he gave them all of uh, this, okay? And verse 5, he says, you know, the Jewish people also came from the fathers, their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. And, you know, they also consider David as uh, as well as one of their forefathers. And it says, in the line of all of them, you know, the line of Jewish race, Jesus 
uh, in the natural came from this race, came from this nation. He was born as a, a Jew. So the, the Jews or the Israelites were so uh, privileged, okay, uh, because they had all of these things, you know, the promises, the covenants, the glory, uh, the adoption as being children of God to be chosen. Um, there's where their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and uh, David as well. And through this lineage, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the Savior of the world, was also born, uh, came from this race, from this uh, nation. And then he says, you know, Christ who Christ came, who is overall the eternally blessed God. So he calls Jesus Christ, note how he calls Jesus Christ here, he calls him as the eternally blessed God. So when people ask us, in, they show me in the Bible, where does it show that, you know, Jesus Christ is God? So here we can easily show, because it says, who came according to the flesh, Christ came according to the flesh in the Jewish race, he was born in the Jewish uh, race, uh, but he is eternally blessed God. So this is one of the places that we can point to them to show that he is eternally God um, and he is eternally blessed God because it's uh, mentioned here who Jesus uh, Christ is. Okay. Now going on to verses uh, 6 to uh, verse 13. Uh, can somebody read that please? Verses 6 to 13 uh, slowly and clearly for us, somebody? Verses 6 to 13. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but to Isaac shall their offspring be made. This means that it is not the children of the flesh or the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived a children by one man, our poor father, Isaac, though they were not yet born and having done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written. Verse 13, as is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Okay, thank you very much, Asha. Okay, in, uh, you know, these are uh, a little controversial verses to, uh, you know, understand and to discern, but uh, I'll just explain it. And then if you have any doubts, maybe we can, I can explain even uh, the, the verses, uh, you know, from, was 14 to 18 and then we can take up any uh, questions because they are all interlinked okay so um in verse 6 you know paul is saying uh, but it's not that the word of god has taken no effect for they are not all israel who are of israel so it says god chose the nation of israel yes he spoke wonderful uh, things to them he gave them wonderful promises but what god has spoken about them uh, you know uh, is it wasted or in ineffective no it's not wasted it's not ineffective it still holds uh, so in verse 7 he says nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. So he explains that not everyone who is a Jew in the natural was what God was referring to when he says that, you know, they are, they will be the sons of promise. So they will, uh, there will be children who will inherit uh, the promise. So what Paul is basically saying here is not that everyone who is a Jew in the natural, who was born uh, as a Jew or Jewish parents or to the Jewish race, what, uh, what God was referring to as in Isaac, your seed shall be called, or, you know, they will uh, they be called as children because they're the seed of Abraham. But he goes on to say that, you know, 
God wasn't talking about natural people, but the children of promise. So they are the ones who are the real descendants that God was uh, speaking of. So who are these children of promise? The children of promise here are, he's talking about believers, both uh, Jews and uh, Gentile. So what basically Paul is saying here is that, you know, when when God said that, uh, you know, uh, the, the children, be, uh, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called, he says not all children means not all those who are born of the Jewish race uh, in the natural, what was, what was, what uh, God was referring to as the children of promise, but he was basically referring to those uh, who would be children of promise who put their faith in Jesus Christ. So it's not just Jews by natural birth, but it's also here talking about children of promise as referring to believers, both Jews and Gentiles. And so he says, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. So God wasn't talking of natural people, but children of promise, uh, who are the ones who are the real descendants that God was speaking of. And who are these real descendants that God is speaking of are those who put their faith in uh, Jesus Christ. And he says, at this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So we see that God gave a promise to Abraham and Sarah that they will have a son. And, uh, you know, you know, Paul is just presenting a thought here. And he says, not only this, but, you know, Think about this as well. You know, he says he's talking about uh, Isaac and uh, uh, he's talking about uh, Rebecca here and uh, he's talking about their children. And even before uh, Esau and Jacob were uh, born, you know, God is actually uh, uh, predetermining things for them. He's speaking about them, he's speaking of them. He says, uh, The old shall serve the younger. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have uh, hated. Okay, he says, older, the older shall serve the younger. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have it hated. So even before the children were born and could have any say, you know, God says, the older shall serve the younger. And he says, that Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, this is what he refers to. In verse 11 now, verse 11 is actually the big verse. He says, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not by, not of works, but of him who calls. So God's predetermined purpose in this case, he has already selected Jacob. And here we see his selection is not based on works because he says, no, not on works, but of him who calls, but it was according to the call of God. So God selected, you know, uh, Jacob over Esau according to his purpose and his calling. Um, and uh, he, you know, was the one who chose uh, the person. Now, when we look back at what God says here, you know, the older shall serve the younger, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Um, you know, this was, it looks like, you know, uh, that God has already selected, you know, God has already planned ahead of time. And uh, since God already selects or God already plans ahead of time, then we don't have anything uh, to say, okay? Um, you know, uh, we just go with God, what God wants uh, to do because he's already decided in his head, he's already planned in his head. But uh, we, we know that this is not true from the rest of scripture. Okay, so how do we interpret this, uh, uh, you know, this verse uh, in the light of what uh, he says uh, in the rest of other scripture? Now, we know in the rest of other scripture, you know, we always need to interpret scripture in the light of other scripture. So in other scripture, we also see the rest of scripture that, you know, God has given man the free will to choose. Okay, we see that right in the Garden of uh, Eden. Okay, when uh, God created Adam and Eve, but he gave them an own mind. He gave them a will to choose. He told them what to choose and what not to choose, but he gave them a, a free will. So even as we read uh, these chapters uh, in verses 
chapters 9 to uh, chapter 11 of Romans, we need to see it in the light of, uh, you know, of, you know, of the rest of scripture, what God has revealed to us in the rest of scripture. In the rest of scripture, we see that, you know, um, God has given man the free will to uh, choose. And if you don't see these chapters in the light of you know what god has revealed that he has given man the free will to choose we will most likely come away with this idea that god has already decided everything you know we are just like puppets uh, god just uses us to fulfill his purpose and each one is already predetermined to do something the choices that they make uh, uh, you know, we should not come away with this thought. We shouldn't read all of this with blinders on, but we need to read this in the light of other scriptures. The light of other scriptures, we see that man has the free moral will to choose. For example, Adam and Eve. Now we know that God created Adam and Eve. He told them uh, what the tree not to eat, for, not to eat from, and the rest of the trees that they can eat from. But God when Adam and Eve chose to eat from the tree that God asked them not to do, to eat from, you know, God did not predetermine Adam and Eve's choice. We need to get that right, okay? God did not predetermine Adam and Eve's choice. He did not predetermine that, you know, they would go and choose this. They would go and uh, sin and disobey him, okay? So this was not a predetermined choice of God. But it was Adam's choice. It was Adam who made the choice. He had two options in front of him, but you know he was uh, the one who made the choice. Did God know that he's going to make the choice? Yes, God knew beforehand that he's going to make the choice. Uh, uh, and he also had another plan uh, uh, to come into motion, but it was not God who predetermined uh, Adam's choice. So let's take another example, like Moses. You know, Moses, uh, when he struck the rock twice, God did not ask him to strike the rock like he asked him previously, asked him to speak to the rock, and he struck the rock twice. You know, we know that uh, he sinned against God. He disobeyed God. He dishonored God in, in the eyes of the Israelites. And uh, what was the result, the consequences of that? They could not enter the promised land, just like Adam and Eve. They forfeited their uh, privilege of, uh, you know, living in, um, uh, the Garden of, <clears throat> sorry, to live in the Garden of Eden and also to have dominion over the earth. So did God, uh, you know, predetermine Adam's uh, or, or Moses' choice? No, it was Moses who was angry, who got angry and who struck the rock. Uh, choice. It was not God who predetermined the choice for him. So we need to understand uh, these chapters, chapters 9 to chapters 11, in the light of what uh, I just said, that, you know, God has given us a free moral will to choose. He's given man a free moral uh, will to choose. So Paul is saying here, um, you know, yes, there is a purpose of God for Jacob and Esau, but in God's predetermined purpose, he already said that the older will serve the younger, okay? So by stating this, he's not predetermining their choices. He's only stating ahead of time what their choices are going to be because he knows what the uh, Esau is going to choose that he's going to sell his birthright just for a bowl of, uh, uh, you know, a soup or broth, you know, just because he was so hungry that he even doesn't care for his spiritual birthright. He does not have any, um, you know, he does not have any uh, honor or respect um, and, and consider his birthright as a worthless thing that he's willing to sell it for a, uh, uh, for a, a bowl of soup. But we see that, you know, uh, even though uh, uh, Jacob was a crafty man, so to say, he was not right, he was not perfect, but he was somebody who uh, pursued uh, God's heart, pursued the plan of God. He wanted his spiritual inheritance. And uh, so here by stating, by God saying that, you know, the older shall serve the younger, it's not that God is making the choice for them or he's predetermined, uh, you know, what they're going to do, but he's already, uh, or he's predetermining their choices, but he already knows beforehand, you know, what choices uh, they're going to make, what choice Esau is going to make, what choice Jacob is going to make. And what he's doing here is he's basically, um, 
you know, just stating uh, their choice. And, uh, you know, it's only stating ahead of time what their choices were going to be, but God is equally open to both of them, okay? Um, and because of these choices that he stated ahead of time, uh, he knows, you know, who is going to choose him, who is not going to choose him. And hence he says that he would love one and hate the other. Now, when it says you know, he, uh, he will hate the other, we also need to remember and, uh, you know, uh, you, we need to uh, uh, interpret this in the light of scripture. Uh, we know that 1 John says God is love. Okay, when God is love, he cannot have hate. If he has hate in him, he has sin in him, and uh, he cannot be God. He's not perfect. Okay, so uh, hated means just that he did not, uh, you know, he did not uh, 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 like the choice, or he did not go with the choice that uh, Esau had uh, made. But why did God say, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated? If we read uh, about this, uh, this incident, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 to 17, he says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So look at the, the, the harsh words or the strong words the writer of Hebrews refers to uh, Esau. He refers to him as a fornicator and profane man. Now, you know what was Esau's mistake, right? He, um, he comes from hunting. He's famished. He's extremely hungry, hungry, so hungry that, uh, you know, he just, just wants a food, something to eat immediately. And uh, we know that Jacob uses the opportunity and tells him to give his birthright to him. And, you know, um, uh, we see that, you know, uh, he just willing to give up his birthright uh, for, uh, you know, for just for a bowl of soup. Okay, so here is a man who's living for immediate gratification of his flesh. There's no worth for his uh, for spiritual calling, spiritual standing, spiritual inheritance. Whereas we see Jacob was not a perfect man. Uh, he cheated his brother, he cheated his father, he ran away. Uh, and his basically the word Jacob even means cheater. But in spite of all his imperfections, he had a heart towards God. Okay, Esau was willing to sell or give away everything that God had on his life. You know, it was God's calling as the older, what God called him for his life, the inheritance, the promises that was going to be passed on from generation to generation. He was going to inherit uh, it, but he had no significance for that. He had no worth for that. He, had, he, he did not look at it as something that's valuable. And he gave up everything just for a, a bowl of, uh, of soup or just for a meal. So Jacob was not perfect, but he sorted God. You know, he wanted the spiritual uh, inheritance, the birthright. Um, we also see later in, we read in Genesis chapter 32, that he engaged with God. He was not willing to let go of God, uh, you know, until God blessed him. And uh, we see that, you know, ultimately he receives uh, uh, his blessing and his name is changed to uh, from Jacob to Israel. So he, we see his spiritual pursuit for God. And that is what touched the, uh, uh, the heart of God in spite of his uh, character flaws. And he engaged with God and he got what he uh, wanted. So here, God knowing ahead of time what their choices that these two young people are going to make. Hence, God says, you know, uh, uh, he says that... Uh, Older shall serve the younger, and Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have uh, hated. I just, you know, love means I love the choice that he made, but I hate the choice that, uh, you know, or detest the choice that, or saddened by the choice that Esau has um, made. So God says this based on foreknowledge and not on predetermining their individual choices. So you need to, you know, uh, remember this. This is not something that he predetermined their choices to be, or he did not predetermine that they are going to, you choose this and you choose that. But it was his foreknowledge that he knew ahead of time that, you know, what Jacob is going to choose and what we saw is going to choose. So if we say that God predetermined their choices, uh, then Esau could have turned around and told God, God, you predetermined my choice, you are to be blamed. Okay. Uh, and we see, you know, Paul is not talking about 
this, on this whole aspect, he talks about the ana analogy of a potter and clay. Um, you know, the potter in this instance, you know, potter in the natural, if you look, the potter makes the clay, the clay has no uh, say in what kind of shape or object the potter is going to make. But in our instance, we are, it's different, you know, we have the potter who is God, we are the clay, but uh, we as a clay, God has not made us mere puppets or uh, as dumb beings, but he's given us a mind, he's given us a will to choose, and we have a say. And God respects our uh, uh, the choices that we uh, make, okay? Remember in chapter 1, we read that, you know, uh, even though uh, God has revealed himself in creation, that, you know, the creation reveals the invisible attributes of God, his, uh, his divine power and his Godhead, but still, you know, people, even though having a knowledge of this, they still chose to give in uh, to, you know, uh, uh, lustful, evil desires and worshipping uh, um, uh, gods that are no gods. And what does it say? Uh, Paul says, you know, God, uh, Paul says in chapter one, God gave them up to their deprived mind. That means God gave them up to the choices that they make. This is your choice. Go ahead. You choose. And, you know, so uh, he's not somebody who treats us like puppets, but he, you know, we, we read there in, in Romans chapter 1, he gave them up to their own uh, choices. So here also, he gave up Esau to make his own choice. He gave Jacob to make his own uh, choice. So uh, he continues on in verses uh, 14 to 18, where he says, what shall we, we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Verse 16, he says, So then it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Verse 17, for the scripture says to, uh, to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Verse 18 says, therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills, he hardens. So uh, Paul is continuing with this discussion and he's, he's bringing about uh, a few more examples here about Pharaoh uh, and about what he tells Moses. But in verse 14, he says, you know, he asks a question. Again, he brings, you know, he follows the same style, what he's doing in the book of Romans, asking these rhetorical questions uh, where he answers, has the question and gives the answer himself. So Paul is saying, uh, asking a question that you and I would be inclined to ask uh, after reading the previous verses where it says, is God being unjust? And he chooses some, he, you know, he loves some, he hates others. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, he says, no, certainly not. That's not who God is. But here he says, um, you know, I will have, but, you know, God speaks to Moses. And so uh, Paul is saying, you know, God says, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I, will com I have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Now, you know, when we read this, uh, we need to understand that you know his mercy god's mercy and compassion are extended on everyone like it says in psalm so we need to interpret this scripture you know romans chapter 9 uh, verse 15 uh, you know not thinking that you know god has mercy on some he does not have mercy on the others he shows compassion on some he doesn't show compassion on others when we're saying this when we're believing this we're saying God is partial. And it says in God's word that, you know, God says, I am not partial. I'm not a partial uh, God. I show no partiality. You know, uh, for he, Paul himself says, for God, there is no Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Uh, all are one before him. So when we read this, we need to read it and also interpret it in the light of the rest of scripture. He says here uh, that, you know, in, in Psalms chapter 145 verses 9 to 10 it says the lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works so you know mark the words there the lord is good to all okay and his tender mercies are over all his works the lord is gracious and slow to anger okay and so we know that god's mercy and compassion is extended to 
everyone. And so we need to understand God's mercy and compassion, not as being selective and partial. God is not selective and partial in his expression of being merciful and uh, compassion, uh, compassionate, but his mercy and compassion are extended to everyone. But okay, his mercy and compassion begins to work in the lives of those who choose to receive it. Now, God's mercy and compassion is for everyone, just like, you know, his eternal life is for everyone. He died on the cross for everyone. But, you know, those who believe in him, God so loved the world, you know, he loved the world that he gave his only son for everyone in the world. But it says those who, but whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal uh, life. So the same principle who works here, God is gracious and compassionate and loving and merciful to everyone, but his mercy and compassion begins to work in the lives of those who receive it. And here in this context, when what Paul is talking about is specifically in the life of Jacob. Now what happened in Jacob's life was God's grace and compassion, but it was not selective or partial care and compassion. It was because he opened his life to uh, you know, receive God's compassion and His uh, mercy. So we need to interpret this, you know, this verse that you know I, God says, "I will show mercy on whom I want to show mercy, show compassion on whom I want to show compassion." In the light of other scripture, that God is compassionate, gracious to all, but it is those who you know um, open up or receive. Uh, his compassion and his mercy. It's in their, those people's life that his compassion and his mercy really works. So in verse 16 uh, of chapter 9, he says, So then, it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. So here the focus is not on the person who's making the choice of saying yes uh, to God, you know, and opening their lives to receiving his mercy. Uh, in this instance, Jacob, you know, uh, Yes, Jacob made the right choice. Uh, he ran with what pleased God. But we can't say Jacob was the hero. You know, it was still because God extended his mercy and grace or his compassion towards him. Why did God extend his mercy and compassion towards him? It's because he opened up his life. He came to that place where he was willing to receive God's mercy, compassion and his uh, 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 blessing. Okay, uh, remember when he wrestles with the, the angel, uh, with God, and he says, I will not let you go till you bless uh, me. So he was basically, you know, wanting his spiritual in inheritance, spiritual birthright. He wanted that. He was opening himself up to God's mercy, compassion, and his uh, blessing. Okay, whereas we see that, um, you know, um, uh, Esau was close to that. Okay, he, he was not... He was not open to the things of God. And when he was open, it was very late. He had already lost his uh, blessing, uh, his inheritance, his birthright. So is God being unfair? No, it's because of the choices that each one of them um, made. And he did not predetermine their choice, but he foreknew the choices that they're going to uh, make. So just uh, before we close, we look at verse 17, where it says, but scripture says, a Pharaoh, for this very pu purpose, God says, you know, telling Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Okay, and then verse 9, 18, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. So God raised Pharaoh, uh, you know, through whom God chose to fulfill his purpose and show his power. Uh, did God, uh, you know, did God harden his heart? Uh, or did God, uh, uh, you know, did uh, did Pharaoh harden his heart? Okay, but Scripture, as we read, says Pharaoh hardened his heart, and it also says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay, so the whole question is: Did God harden his heart, uh, you know, to to disobey God or to go against Him or not to be willing to yield or to let the people go? Um, how did Pharaoh harden his heart? So what does scripture say? Scripture says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and God also hardened Pharaoh's heart. So if God 
uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart, then you know Pharaoh is not to be blamed. So how do we understand this? Again, we understand it in the light of the rest of Scripture. Like I just said, we in Romans one, you know, we read that God gave them up to their deprived, depraved minds. Uh, you know, we know that God did not make their minds as depraved minds. Uh, he did not, uh, you know, he did not predetermine that they would choose other gods. Uh, but we see that, you know, people made their own choice. And we also see that God did not prevent them from going that way. He let them, you know, he let them go into their depraved mind to do what their depraved mind wants to do. And it led to every kind of evil behavior and action. So here we must understand it in uh, this scripture passage of um, verses 17 and 18 and the rest of other scripture as um, well you know so here we see that you know um, yes pharaoh chose to harden his heart so as pharaoh chose to harden his own heart god let him you know go his way he said okay you want to choose to harden your heart you don't want to obey you don't want to give in that's fine so god allowed him to go his own way to harden his heart um, and, you know, he chose, Pharaoh chose to harden his heart uh, to the God that Moses was talking about, the miracles Moses was doing in the name of God. Uh, Pharaoh said, I don't care, you know, I'm stronger and bigger than your God. So since Pharaoh chose to harden his, his own heart, God let him do it. And that is what, you know, scripture means when it says that God, uh, you know, hardened Pharaoh's heart. That means, that doesn't mean God uh, hardened his heart, it means that God just let him be hard-hearted. He just let him make his own choice. He let him just pursue his hard-heartedness, uh, you know, to think he's bigger and stronger than God and he does not care. Uh, it does not mean that God hardened it, his heart. It was Pharaoh who chose to harden his heart. It was just God who allowed him to make his own uh, choices. So as Pharaoh cho chose uh, you know, to harden his heart, it only got, it only gave an opportunity for God to display his greatness and his power. So even if Pharaoh would not have hardened his heart, irrespective of that, God could have just still shown his greatness and power, you know, uh, but here, you know, that was Pharaoh's choice. He chose. It was not God's choice for him, but we see that, you know, uh, God used this opportunity to display his greatness and his Power. And therefore, he says, I have mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens, which means that's not God saying that I will have mercy on some and I will harden some people's heart. No, it's he's basically saying, I know who's going to choose, uh, you know, my mercy, and I'm going, I know who's going to harden their hearts, and I'm just going to let them choose to make their own choices. But those who, you know, open their hearts and their lives to my mercy and compassion, I will show my mercy and compassion. Those who choose to hurt hard in their hearts, you know, they will uh, experience the their own uh, uh, the repercussions of their own choices, uh, and they will live out the repercussions of their own choices. Okay, we we'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Sorry, I took a little extra time. Anyone has any questions? able to understand okay okay anyone else any questions any doubts okay if there's no questions any doubts and it is clear for all of you uh, praise God that you understood it uh, and um, yeah, we'll uh, meet on Friday. We'll continue with the rest of the verses in chapter 9. Thank Sorry for taking three minutes of your extra time. Um, uh, after I just stop recording, I just want to speak to a couple of you about the assignment, assessment. So just give me a minute, please.